This is Antic, the Atari 8-Bit Podcast. I'm Kay Savitz. Dr. Sherman Rosenfeld is an internationally known leader in informal learning and science education. He was a consultant to the Atari Institute for Education Action Research. Founded in 1981 and led by Ted Kahn, the Institute provided equipment, advice, and financial support to nonprofit educational organizations. It granted more than a million dollars in hardware and software to schools, science museums, vocational and special education programs, and even a prison. Ted Kahn, whom I've previously interviewed, recently dug through his files to uncover several documents about the Institute, including Informal Learning and Computers, the working paper written by Sherman Rosenfeld for the Atari Institute in September 1982. Ted also graciously scanned a 1981 Atari Institute brochure, a 1983 Progress Report, and Atari in Action, the Institute's newsletter, dated Fall 1982. This interview took place on May 25, 2020. Sherman talked to me from his office in Israel. So I was born uh, in Los Angeles uh, to a family, uh, medical family. My mom was a nurse, my dad was a doctor. Um, so I obviously studied biology. First, a child in um, a family of six. Uh, we lived in um, 10 places from the time I was born to the time I was 13. Uh, traveled a lot to different houses. I uh, ended up at 4915 Densmore Avenue uh, in Sino from the age of 13 to 18. That was the, the five years at one spot that was really uh, special. And then, um, then I went off to college. I went to uh, University of Chicago for my first year. I loved it, but it was a bit, uh, I had kind of like a, a bit of home, home uh, sickness, and so I wanted to go closer to home. Second year, I went to Berkeley, which is uh, in California, but far enough from Los Angeles, so I felt a little bit independent. Uh, third year, I went on junior, junior year abroad to uh, uh, the Hebrew University in, uh, in Jerusalem. That was the year right after the Six Day War, and the world, the, the world in Israel was in euphoria because they thought this is now going to bring in peace because we're now going to give back the West Bank and Gaza to the Arabs and then we're going to have peace. Everyone was really excited, even the Arabs it seemed. Uh, and it was a very pivotal time in my life because um, I ended up coming here. But I went back for my senior year at Berkeley. Um, and then um, um, ended up um, Marrying um, somebody else who had been on the Junior Abroad program, um, Melody, Melody Rosenfeld, 1972. Uh, we spent 10 years um, in, uh, in America. Um, we had spent uh, one year in Israel together after 67, where we, made, we were both on the Junior Abroad program. And um, we, we also spent a, a year at the uh, Medrash at Stable Care, um, which is the uh, Ben Gurion, not far from Ben Gurion's kibbutz. There is a special educational institution, and we were we were there from 1971 to 72, teaching. I taught biology, and then worked as a, a counselor for 39 ninth graders. And my wife taught English, and we actually were thinking of staying in Israel, but we were convinced to come back. Um, finish up our education, you know, make some money and get a, get a job, you know, whatever. And we did that, took us 10 years, we came back. So I've been here since 82. Um, I'm stationed at the Weizmann Institute of Science. I work in science education. Um, one of my big interests is informal science education. And I've written a lot about it and it led me into project-based learning. So I've been a great advocate and done a lot of us uh, work and studies, research um, on lots of different uh, areas in, in that field of project-based learning. And uh, in the midst of all this stuff, in fact, when we were still in Berkeley, I um, ran into Ted Kahn. Ted Kahn is the main player in this, in this story because he turned out to be the, uh, the person who started the Atari Institute for Education Action Research. And uh, you can go from there. But basically, uh, the, the uh, relationship I have with Ted Kahn is a very special one. I have to mention 
that from the beginning. He was um, a, a student of, uh, of uh, I think, computer science. And we met at the Lawrence Hall of Science. The Lawrence Hall of Science sits above, for those of you who know Berkeley and the Bay Area, has a great view of the entire Bay Area from the Lawrence Hall of Science, sits on the mountain above the Berkeley campus. And we were both there working at the same time. We got to be very friendly. Found it had a lot of interests together in terms of educational technology, education, making things, uh, making school safe and, and special for kids. And, um, and that's basically where our friendship started. And, uh, and then in, in 1982, when this um, position paper we're about to talk about was prepared and presented, that was a pivotal year because it was right after I'd spent, uh, I finished my doctorate and spent three years uh, um, running a community science center in uh, Fresno, California called the Discovery Center. And right before we took off to go to Israel. So that's, that's a personal part of my history that this uh, paper was written. And the paper was also written at a, at a special time because it was both a combination of what I had done for my PhD uh, work, which is in formal education. We can get into that a bit later. And it was a time when um, the Atari Institute was giving away free computers and bringing people together to sort of see what was going to happen in the field of education. And I, having done work in informal education and working also with this new thing called a laptop, you know, whatever that was, and we didn't know what that was. We had, I remember we had done, four, I don't know if you remember Fortran and coming up with these cards and going down to the the mainframe to run your program. Well, here's just some kind of a this little thing you put on your desktop and, and what was it gonna do? And so there was a lot of these things in the air and I thought about bringing this, these, two, these two things together, the computers and also the informal education. So that's how the paper was, was born. And I guess we can go from there with uh, any questions you have. Sure, all right. Um, let's talk briefly about what informal education is. So, so informal learning is, uh, is an interesting term um, because we're so, so much in, into learning with schools that we forget that the field of formal learning is really the, the field of humans before school. You know, when, when we, um, we think about, you know, about the, uh, the early hominids and, and, you know, the people that turned into us, you know, we uh, basically, um, you know, left the, the plains of Africa and into Europe, maybe about 100,000 years ago, 70,000 years ago, came into our own. Uh, about 10,000 years ago, you know, we had the agricultural revolution. And um, most of that time, like 99.99% of that time, we didn't have schools. And so when you think about how did we learn? How did we progress? How did we do what we did? Um, that's informal education. Um, informal education becomes important uh, in, you know, from the middle 1900s on when schools become so much a part um, of, of our consciousness and our reality. So today, informal education does not seem like it was back then when we had apprenticeship and we had, um, you know, all of the, the other... Um, uh, in formal education uh, structures that was basically most of our lives. And so it, it became sort of like an offset to the school life. And it, um, it could, could be what you did in, uh, when you were in um, um, you know, groups of, of people interested in what you wanted to do, like if you wanted to be an astronomy buff or you know, wanted to do something with uh, bot botanical knowledge and planting, um, all the way to reading, um, the media, you know, um, and museums and zoos, aquaria, all of the um, informal education institutions. So I think that informal education is basically learning uh, whenever you want to learn about whatever you want to do, and it doesn't have to be in a school context. Um, I find myself 
being drawn to projects that bring together out of school and in school uh, learning. One of the things that I have been very involved with after the writing of the Atari paper uh, and work at the Weizmann Institute has been bridging the gap between formal and informal. Because when you think about it, there's a great motivational advantage to informal education. You're doing something because you really have the passion to do it. You want to do it. No one's making you do your homework. I, what you're, the way that you're learning about Atari is through informal education, informal sure. learning. It's, it's self-motivated. Let's put it that way. Okay, so schools we know sometimes tend to be onerous and you know, oppressive, top-down. You got to do this, you got to do that. So I always have the feeling that something bringing these, these, two, these two things together um, to, to bring projects or bring it, the intrinsic motivation into schools or bringing the kids out of the schools into places they could really find exciting as being a win-win for everyone. So that's kind of a, a long-winded answer to the question of what is informal uh, education. I will say that when this paper was written in 1982, this was just the beginning of informal learning as a field. Uh, my mentor and the mentor of, of many people in the field, uh, Professor uh, Matt Watson Lech, who just passed away about three months ago, um, of blessed memory, he was a, a pioneer in the area of informal learning, and he he himself was a professor of botany, um, the director of the Berkeley UC Berkeley Botanical Garden, and also the director of the Lawrence Hall of Science, this um, science museum or science center, and he asked the question as a, as a biologist or a botanist, you know, how do people learn when they don't have to learn? And a group of people like myself and Judy Diamond and, and John Falk and uh, Jeffrey Godfrey, all of us did our, our PhD work in these different places where people learn when they didn't have to learn. So I did mine at the San Francisco Zoo and I asked the question, how do families learn when they don't have to learn in the zoo situation? And um, I basically uh, chose a bunch of um, families randomly, 25 families, followed them throughout the zoo, taking notes on what they were doing, watching what, you know, recording what happened. Then afterwards, uh, uh, talking to them as with my little button as a zoo volunteer and asking them, you know, what have they done and what they thought was interesting, et cetera, et cetera. And then created through that information and that data, a, um, an interactive mini zoo that, uh, that had interactive activities uh, as well. And so uh, Judy Diamond did her, her work in the Exploratorium, um, which had its own history as a, a very, very special uh, museum that, that changed the whole face, the face of science museums around the world. And Jeff Godfrey in the uh, bio lab at the Lawrence Hall of Science, and Sam Taylor uh, did his work at the San Francisco Aquarium, Natural Aquarium, Natural History Museum. Lab. Also, so um, I think this was a special time because that whole field was just getting started. Today, the field of informal education or formal learning, there, there's it's just blossomed. You know, so you have, uh, you know. Informal educators in zoos, informal educators in, muse in museums, science museums, art history museums, uh, natural history museums, or programs for museums. And then there's all sorts of uh, out of school learning um, in clubs, uh, summer camps, youth groups, um, the 4 H, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that the, the field itself now is, uh, is really blossoming. Um, at least it started to blossom about that time when this paper was written. All right. So let's talk about the paper. Um, it was called uh, Informal Learning and in Computers, a working paper prepared for the Atari Institute for Education Action Research, September 1982. Um, it's 37 pages. How, how and why did this paper come about? Well, I think that, you know, Ted and I would share a lot of information and ideas and uh, as being really best friends, we spoke a lot about these things. Um, he was, um, the, the program I'm talking about is Sesame at, at Berkeley, it's called the Search for Excellence in Science and Math Education. 
he was sort of like an adjunct student. He was studying to, for his PhD in, I think it was educational psychology. And, uh, but he also had a strong interest in computers and he and his brother, Bob, uh, created um, a, a program for computers for, for, for kids. And we talked about these ideas. And so I think it was his initiative that I write a paper about. He says, look, you got all these ideas and uh, you just finished your, your PhD about it. And you know, why don't you try to put together a, a paper? So it was actually the first paper from the Atari Institute. I don't know if there were others written, on, but I know it's number one, because that's what it's written on the, on the page. And that's how, how it got started. He basically said, look, Sherm, you, you know, that's, why don't you do it? And um, that's what I did. All right. And so can you summarize the paper and what, what points you tried to make in so it? So I would try to summarize it very simply. I basically, very simply uh, talked about what informal learning is, a little bit more academic, talking about how you do research in it, how do you understand it, and then uh, the value of it, the value of the motivation in informal learning. And then I said, let's look at the computer and what is a computer as a metaphor for learning? Because um, at that time, you had the computers as a, as a personal device. Um, I think the personal computer, that was a term coined, if not mistaken, by Alan Kay. Um, it was kind of a, a weird idea for us because we thought a computer would compute. That's what computers did. They computed. And we would bring our cards into Fortran, into this big mainframe, and it would compute. What we didn't understand, I think, at that time, Ted and I were talking about this, is that, and Ted knew this a lot more, uh, a lot more in depth, that computers are really uh, learning machines, like what Alan Kay was, his, his goal, the Dynabook. His goal was to create these portable, personal uh, machines, what we have today and we take for granted. At that time, it seemed like, science fiction fantasy. So as I, what I was trying to do in the paper was saying, okay, let's try to see what we can, how we can see the merging of informal learning with this learning device, with the computer as a metaphor for learning. And what, what are some possibilities that might come out of that? Um, that was basically, it was basically a, a call to, to look at these two areas and try to, um, bring them together in some kind of a happy marriage. I mean, I could go into details more about it. At the end of the paper, there was uh, a list of all sorts of um, resources in informal learning, including a whole list of people who just then were beginning to uh, research this area or had interest in this area. And, um, and then there were some recommendations at the end um, to, to sort of promote the, the discussion uh, of the, these kinds of ideas. Right. I'm interested particularly in the, in the recommendations section. Um, the Institute should become a clearinghouse of information and models of excellence uh, in the area of informal learning. The Institute should take an active role in creating new models uh, in the areas of informal learning. Well, you know, the question you might uh, logically ask was, were these uh, recommendations implemented? <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, one of the one of the recommendations I had uh, was that there should be a, a clearinghouse for mm -hmm. for uh, for this kind of research and interest, and there should be a conference put together. To my knowledge, uh, these recommendations were not uh, implemented, and I'm not sure why. Part of the reason is that I went to Israel, and maybe not being there to sort of uh, to move this along uh, may be in one answer. And, and I think that, uh, I'm not sure, when did the Atari Institute for Education and Action Research actually end? I think there was a- That's a good, that's a good question. Things, things were generally fizzling out in weird ways around Atari in, in 1984. I'm not sure that the Institute was ever actually put to bed. I think it might've just sort of faded away. Um, yeah. So Ted those, might have I, better information it about have been that. But. Both that, both the fact that I had gone overseas and that there was some turmoil in Atari. And I think, you know, I, I'd like to mention here that um, just a call out to Ted for being such a pioneer. 
he was willing and able, he succeeded to put together a, something that went against the corporate grain at Atari. Atari was, saw itself as a game um, computer. Yeah. And, and for the people who are interested in this kind of stuff, uh, you might have the, um, um, the resources and the knowledge at hand, but this was a computer far, far ahead in graphics, sound, um, abilities, and characteristics than, than, the, than the Apple IIe, which was at that time was very primitive in, in all of those things. And what, what Ted noticed was that this could be an incredible education computer. Um, he wasn't able to make the case strongly enough to the corporate culture, uh, unfortunately. And so because the corporate culture put all of its eggs in the basket of games, um, it wasn't able to move into this field of education. And I think then when the gaming industry sort of took a, a dump, a, a turn down, they, they weren't able to, to sort of um, gear up into a different field. But Ted had the idea, and I think it was a great idea, to, to turn uh, the Atari computer into uh, an educational computer. It was a good idea. I mean, Apple back then got a lot of credit for getting itself into all of the schools. And that the schools bought Apple IIs, and then therefore the kids went home and said, Mom, Dad, I want a computer. And what do they know? They got the Apple II. And it seems like Atari really made an effort with this to, to get their computers into schools and into science museums and into other places of, of learning. I mean, and partially by giving what $1.3 million worth of computers to these, these institutions. Well, you know, I can tell you from pers personal history, when I went after my, my doctorate, which I finished in 1980, 79, 80, I went to, um, through Fresno, where I was the director of the Discovery Museum, and we uh, won a grant through the Atari Institute to get uh, three, muse three, three Atari computers that we set up as exhibits in our museum. And they were very, very popular. Um, and it, was, it wasn't just the, the games that were important. Of course, these were, these were games, of course, but they were also educational games. I think there was a lot of educational software that was coming out for the Atari computer as the Apple computer to try to merge these, these fields of informal learning and computers. And uh, Atari made a, a, an attempt through uh, what Ted was doing, um, but I don't think they were invested in that like, as Apple was. Apple, I think, had an inferior uh, computer when it comes to education. I mean, it didn't have all the bells and whistles and all the, the power that, and, and they, but they had in their mindset that they wanted this to, to be educational. Atari, on the other hand, had a far superior product, but they didn't have their own mindset that this was going to be into education. I think they, they didn't really give it serious thought. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, what's your take on it? You've interviewed tons of people. No, I, I think you're right. I think Atari didn't know what they had and didn't know how to market it right. And what they did know was games. I mean, there's an example, and this is something Ted and I talked about a lot back then, and, and that uh, we know that um, the mouse, right, the very the famous mouse, and the uh, and the um, you know what you see is what you get, you know, visual interface. Mm -hmm. They all came out of Xerox Park, yeah. you know, which was basically the Western division of Xerox. And, and Xerox didn't know what they had. So it took a, a visit from Steve Jobs to, to Xerox Park to see it. And then he basically lifted it and took it you know, to, uh, to the Mac. And then of course it was, it's found its way into Microsoft. But there's a whole history of, of, of inventions that um, don't find their way through the inventors. And I think that the Atari uh, computer is an example of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sometimes the people who create the thing don't have the vision to get the thing. Right, and if you world. have a vision to use something which is not as sophisticated, like the Apple uh, mm -hmm. theme, 
and that has staying power. And then right. so it, it wasn't just, the best machine, but it was good enough. And exactly, it would, but yeah. they had a much more invested uh, mission into education mm -hmm. that made a difference. Uh, how else w were you involved with the Institute uh, beyond writing the paper? Well, I was involved um, in a number of ways. Uh, first of all, talking to Ted all the time and, um, you know, we were very close. So um, we kept in touch on about various goings on. And in one case, I was invited to go to uh, Switzerland where we had a, um, a brainstorming session about uh, the uses of Atari, what Atari, um, what kinds of programs could be written for it. I remember that there was um, um, maybe like a three or four day uh, workshop. I will mention also, since we're talking about history, the, um, the uh, person who was a big influence in both Ted and my life, who was there at the same workshop, was Professor Moshe Kaspi. Also of blessed memory, passed away maybe about uh, 10 or 12 years ago. And uh, he was a mentor for both Ted and for me. He was a professor at the Hebrew University uh, in Jerusalem and an expert on creativity, um, really a, a genius who um, I think inspired us and many other people to think about um, to think about creativity, and he had this knowledge of the of, of self-education. In Hebrew, it's hitbonanut or hitbanut. Hitbanut is to build yourself. So it's self-building or self-education. And he had a whole series of uh, systems that were set up, all mental, all created in the mind, and with with graphics that he was able to put together. He never made that connection. Here's another case of a guy who is not well known today, but he never made that connection of his wonderful ideas and the computer world. One of the things that Ted and I were very frustrated about, we said, you know, Moshe, you have these great ideas. There are these computers that are coming out. You yourself went to this workshop in Lausanne, Switzerland. You should know that this is, this is what's the next, this is the future, but he, he, he never really was able to make that jump. And a lot of the ideas that he has, his, that he had, have now been implemented. Uh, a lot of the creativity, but there's still places to mine his work um, that have not been uh, implemented yet. So I, um, for any of those who are interested in finding out more, I'll be glad to talk to him about that. I have his books and, and uh, he was really a, so he was another a person who was also at that uh, at that conference. So I guess that's the answer to my question. I was in touch with Ted. We we talked a lot about various initiatives, and um, I participated in this uh, conference and others like it. Nice. You um, held creativity workshops to produce innovative software for Atari staff in the U.S. and Europe. Yeah, I believe. Tell me about yeah, yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's exactly what I was mentioned. Uh, the the work that we did at Switzerland, and then we we also had um, workshops in the Bay Area. So, Ted, Ted actually, in a sense, was my mentor in the area of creativity. I mean, I was interested in myself in in this topic, but Ted himself was a was a fiend. I mean, he would collect books and collect ideas, and his personality is such he's always looking for new ideas and new things. And he would be the leader of these workshops. Um, we would talk a lot about different uh, techniques to bring ideas out. I mean, brainstorming was something that Osborne put together in the 50s. There was also Synectics, uh, which was a program uh, using metaphors uh, that uh, came out. There was other programs like the Productive Thinking Program that came out of Covington and Berkeley, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. They're just lots and lots of techniques. There was a journal, actually, a journal of, of creativity uh, that we both read. And um, I think that the, these creativity workshops were, were set up um, and, and run by Ted. And I helped out, but I don't see myself as the main, the main 
mover and shaker. It really was Ted. But he was able to get to a lot of people. Um, actually, David Thornburg was one of them. Um, he was a, an innovator in his own area of, uh, of uh, software development and, and many other people who today probably nobody knows about. Uh, David Malone, um, see, I'm trying to think of other names. A group of people who, who seem to, to be uh, excited about uh, the computer as a learning machine and uh, interactive uh, software. Nice, David Thornburg uh, being the inventor of Qualipad. Yeah. Which was a great educational device. Cool, uh, and you designed some educational software for companies yourself, including Atari? Yes, as a matter of fact, uh, I think as a result of my connection with Ted and my, uh, my work both at the science museums and also uh, you know, with, with Atari, I ended up working for many years with uh, various companies. When I came to Israel, I was um, first working at the uh, youth activity section with uh, Moshe Rishpon. Um, working on the Garden of Science, which is an outdoor science museum. And then later on at the Department of Science Teaching uh, with Batsheva Elon and others, Avi Hofstein and so forth. But during that time, I also was drawn to this field of de developing educational software. So I have a bunch of uh, experiences with that. Uh, personally, I, I work with some people who are trying to bring educational software into schools. I work with people who are trying to develop edutainment. These are sort of fun kinds of uh, exciting software that you would do at home, but they had educational components. The best example was Professor Salvadori. And Professor Salvadori is a group of there were maybe three or four titles that we put together um, in science. One was on uh, uh, water, one was on light and sound, one was on energy, and we would create these problems that um, Professor Salvadori would have to solve, but you had to help him. And it turned out that um, in reality, or in, in, the, in terms of the script of this uh, software program, Professor Salvadori was really kind of a scatterbrain scientist. You'd go into his uh, laboratory and everything was a mess and you'd have to put things together. So by you going through step by step, figuring things out, um, you would come up with the solution and you would get some kind of a diploma because you solved the problem. So that was a, a great example of edutainment. It won a couple of awards uh, and, then saw, and then what happened is a lot of times things happen, but the computer changed and the company went out of business and so there was nobody to take that program and upgrade it to the next uh, computer. I don't know what you call that, but it's a phenomenon I've seen over and over. I'm gonna talk about it today, about a project that I worked on in the 90s, and um, we have a hard time upgrading it to what's happening today. It's, the content is wonderful, but since the educational material can't stand on its own, it has to live in a body, and that body is a computer. When the computer is changed, the platform changes, and there's no one to sort of reinvent it and re-upgrade it you know, into that machine, then it, it basically dies. So I have uh, examples of that in my, uh, my, lab in my library, but uh, it, it's not available, unfortunately. It's really it's a good program. And the other thing I did um, for many years was developing um, simulations. Um, a, um, a shoe salesman at a kibbutz, by the name of Yoel Givol. Uh, he said, you know, computers are coming in here, in Israel, right? Computers are coming in. I've heard that scientists can really create great simulations. I'm gonna to put together a company that, that does this for schools. He didn't know anything else except what I just told you right now. And he was also full of, uh, of initiative. And he was a very initiative, very, very creative kind of guy. So he found some uh, two, uh, two people who uh, had worked in the Israeli army in an intelligence unit developing uh, high-powered uh, software. He says, I want you to create a, um, uh, a format 
um, software format that will run simulations. It'll create the, and have the ability to run a mathematical model with inputs and outputs, and will have a connection to a graphic screen where you can have inputs and outputs, and everything will be animated. And it was a wonderful idea, and I worked with him for many years on that part time, but uh, working on the uh, biological uh, biology programs and uh, some physics programs as well. And then afterwards, I worked at a place called the Center for Educational Technology, um, or Matach in Hebrew, and developing uh, software with them as well. So I think, uh, you know, looking back, that, that period of time with Atari was really a, um, a nascent period. It, it gave birth to a lot of my interest in educational software. Nice. Excellent. Oh, what haven't I asked you about that time with Atari that I should have? Um, well, we've covered what I did there, but we covered uh, Ted and his innovative work. And we covered basically the uh, faux pas or the, uh, the error of the, uh, the culture of Atari and not sort of picking up on what Ted was doing more seriously. I think, um, I think that's about it for that period. Right. Do you think that the, the institution, it seems like its goals were laudable in that it wanted to promote Atari and also to get computers into the hands of people who could use them to, to learn. Do you think that it went far enough? Could it have done more with well, the time it had? You know, I guess uh, I'm a little bit biased in my reading of this. You talk to somebody else, you may have a different reading of it. But my reading of this is that Ted Kahn went into Atari, spoke to the president or whoever he had to talk to and convinced them on the basis of his personality and his love and his enthusiasm. And anybody knows Ted Kahn knows that he can be very enthusiastic uh, about most anything. And he was passionate about this. I think it was his uh, genius that basically lit a little spark, but it was a little spark and it never really changed corporate culture. So I think that the, yes, the Atari Institute for Education and Action Research could have easily um, turned out to be something much bigger, but uh, didn't have the support within the company that it really needed in order to, to get the funds and get the, the buy-in. And um, I think Ted would, would be able to talk about that more. Maybe you talked about that already in, in your earlier interview with him. But I know he tried the best he could, and I know that it lasted for a while. And there were many people, including the kids who came to my science museum, who really benefited from the, uh, from the Institute. But uh, in the end, I think that um, not enough resources and not enough really willpower, corporate willpower was put behind it. Fair enough. Uh, what do you do today? How do you spend your time these days? Uh, today, <laughs> today I spend my time... Uh, talking to people like you on Zoom because of the coronavirus. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I, I find it, by the way, fascinating because, um, so I've been, in, I've been involved um, in education ever since coming here in 82. I work a lot on project-based learning. I work a lot in teacher training. Um, spent a lot of time on uh, middle school science education. Developed uh, a lot of units on uh, bringing uh, project-based learning and science fair to uh, kids in middle school and high school, also elementary school. And uh, if we would talk about the coronavirus period, uh, this last three months, and what that has done to this field of informal learning and education, I think it's a no-brainer. I think what's happened now has been um, is, is going to change the world forever in terms of taking away the, basically that logger hold on the, on the school, on the kids through schools, that the idea that education and learning takes place in schools and only takes place in schools or mostly takes place in schools, it, it was such a destructive idea. And I think that if we look at, I think if, you know, if we can survive on this planet for another 150 years and we can look back I think we'll see from the 1850s until 2030 
the, a blip where the schools were really central. Um, and I think that what's happening now, this is a process that happened beforehand, but uh, the coronavirus is really pushing it over the bridge where we have more blended learning and where we have a lot more um, learning that takes place as I guess the vision was of informal learning, but even upgrading it, even taking it to areas that we we're not even aware of. I'll mention a few areas that I think are going to uh, really make a, a difference. Thank One you. area is going to be in the area of mentoring and in working and kids working with uh, with with scientists or with people in the field who uh, up to now have not been that much connected to internships. I think that there's this kind of um, technology like Zoom and other th things will come out afterwards are going to help to create uh, a, a kind of synergy between those. I think uh, cross-age learning is going to become a lot more uh, powerful. I think that the, the whole uh, industrial model, model of education, which was that, if you think about it, <laughs> education uh, came into schools at the same time that the assembly line did. And, and it was very much influenced by the assembly line, right? You think about cohorts of people of the same age going through an assembly line from kindergarten through high school. And then, you know, um, I think that that model was parodied by um, teachers. Uh, we don't need no education, right? Uh, Pink Floyd. And sure. that whole video of that, that model of, of the assembly line and the, so I think that that's what's happening now with, because of the coronavirus and the use of a lot of, of online um, um, technology is going to help things move in that direction of, uh, of more mentoring, uh, more out of school, more blended learning, and more models that maybe we haven't, haven't thought about. Excellent. Thank you. If you could send a message to the people who still use Atari computers today. <laughs> are there? <laughs> there are. <laughs> um, some of us are playing games. Some of us are programming old computer languages. Some, uh, you know, it, there's a there's hundred reasons why people are still fiddling with these old machines. Um, if you could send them a message, and you can right now, yeah. what would you tell them? I'd say, good for you. I'd, I'd just give you a pat on your back and say, I'm glad you're keeping the tradition alive. Um, you know, Atari doesn't have a footprint in, in the bigger world, but it's good that there are people like you that are, that are still uh, hanging in there and trying to do stuff with what was really a great, a great computer. Um, I don't know what more I can say. Um, maybe even suggest though that, um, maybe you expand your horizons and look at the, uh, at the possible use of computers in areas that um, you may not have thought about. And those areas might be science museums, art history museums, um, and uh, other informal uh, centers of learning. But, uh, but definitely um, I had off, hats off to, to people using Atari. I, I, I loved it also when it came out. I was very sad when it uh, sort of left the market and I'm glad to hear that people are using it still today. Excellent, thank you. Well, I think thank I have you. what I need, German. Thank you so much. Thank you so much and, and keep up this great work. I, I think you're a great example and the people who are using Atari are great examples of uh, what I think is the basis of education, which is uh, intrinsic motivation. That's, what, that's what, what you're doing. You do things because you have a passion. And if we can get more people to find their passion, um, I think the world will be a better place. <laughs>